On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. Donnie Gress of the Boston Red Sox organization. Donnie, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. So I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, Donnie Gress going into now year three with the Boston Red Sox. Um, minor league strength coach, worked with our affiliate in Greenville Drive uh, past two seasons. And how about your journey to the Sox? Obviously, I know it, but for the listeners that don't know you as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I could go down the, the rabbit hole with it. Obviously, prior to the Red Sox, I was at University of Kentucky, um, was actually a GA with Human Resources, worked under our Move Well division of it. So got grad school paid for and got to learn with the, the private sector um, a lot more, especially like working with clientele who may have just been college graduates themselves, um, just trying to get into an exercise routine who worked for the university or could have been an elderly client who was just a uh, a spouse of one of the faculty there that wanted to get back into an exercise routine or just generally like wanted to know more about the gym and kind of the services that uh, human resources had to offer when it came to uh, their move well portion of it. Um, after that wrapped up, I had a summer internship with University of Kentucky, University of Kentucky uh, Olympic strength staff. They do a really good summer internship program um, just to develop young strength coaches from that position was offered to become a coaching assistant uh, with the university. So I worked with under Ryan DeVrent with baseball, softball, gymnastics. And then in my second year there, I uh, actually helped start stunt uh, a new varsity team at the university of Kentucky in the weight room. So pretty cool opportunity there. Um, and then that led into uh, my time with the Red Sox. This has nothing to do with baseball, but how cool was it to work with like gymnastics and with stunt? It, it was honestly really cool. It was funny. I actually just got done working out there and ran into a couple of my previous athletes there. And I remember we have like our daily sheet that we hung out in the rack with their workout for the day. And on the top of it, we put Dickey's Arena, which is like where they host the NCAA championships. And obviously it's been a goal that's been on that sheet every single time they're in the weight room for the past two years. And last year was the first time uh, within the recent uh, time period where they're actually able to make it um, and finish top six in all of NCAA. So really cool to see their transition and them just continuing to elevate the standard of the, the programs that they have. But I mean, it's really different. I mean, everything you do with them is it's detail oriented because their scoring system is all of a subjective measure. Like they're based on perfection. Um, and like you only can get to whatever your skill levels that determine the routine that you're doing and and executing it flawlessly to get the point value that they think you that you deserve yeah it's almost like the opposite of baseball like baseball you're failing all the time and occasionally like you're successful there like you have to be successful all the time you can't like occasionally you can't fail because it makes a difference but gymnasts are just like really like elite of elite athletes, man. Some of the stuff that they do is just really cool. Um, so I'm sure the training was, was probably high, like really high stakes, but probably very rewarding for you, like in your time of like growth and like development as a coach to like have to be that detail oriented that early in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think like the coolest thing about it is like, I think the culture within gymnastics itself is like obviously the competitive excellence piece of it. Like, they want to be really good. And when they're at the level, like the Olympics are like the upper echelon, like the big leagues are for us. Like they want to be an Olympic caliber gymnast growing up. So ever since they could literally walk and crawl, it's like all these girls have been in, in a gym, like working on their talent and their skill. Um, but like upper level division one athletics, when it comes to gymnastics is it's incredible. Like their work ethic um, is no less an elite um they beat the dog crap out of all the other athletes in the room like and it's just because of 
who they are and like what they've come up and their product of everything that they put themselves uh, against. So yeah, it was a really cool experience to work with them and, and see them. Yeah, I don't, I don't plan on having kids, um, but if we ever do, I want them to either do like gymnastics or some sort of martial arts or something that like they have really good control of their body. Um, Karen and I have recently joined a rock climbing gym and it's kind of the same, like I can kind of muscle my way through some of the walls and then there's kids that are like seven years old there and they just like crush the walls and I'm like sitting there just watching them like amazed. They probably think I'm like, you know, a freak or something like, what is this guy doing just sitting there watching? But like, it's really fascinating to me. And then it makes me think like as they get older, one, they're going to have that awareness of their body. Two, they're going to have that relative strength. But three, like, do they end up getting messed up with training? Like, it's almost like those kids are so athletic from a young age. Does training make them like more stiff or like, you know, less able to climb the walls? Because a lot of the like, specifically with the rock climbing that I've been doing, like the mobility it requires and the strength and like the odd positions you're in. And I'm like, these kids can already do this. Like if I put a squat bar on their back, like, am I making them worse or am I going to make them better? Like, I don't, I don't really know. You know what I mean? It's interesting to think about, but I've always said, like, if we have kids, they're going to do some, something that is body weight, spatial awareness oriented. Um, and gymnastics has always been fascinating. And, you know, like you said, those, as young as they can start, they're like on a balance beam or they're like, you know, jumping around or hanging from the rings. Like I, I'm telling you, like there was this little girl at the rock climbing gym and I did a wall and I thought I was like real, I was hyped up that I did it. And she walked up and like looked at me and like did the wall and just jumped down and was like, you stink. And I'm like, oh, I just got <laughs> dominated by this seven-year-old. But also like, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know what I mean? So like from yeah. such a young age, they're able to do some like fascinating things. So I bet it's really cool to see them like, at that peak of like, you know, the college level. And then for you, it's like the training is like, am I going to screw them up? Like by doing things like, I'm sure that all probably weighed into it as well. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is like, that's obviously a big question is like, is the weight room going to be like a detriment to like what their natural abilities are. But then you got to consider the fact of their body needs to be able to prepare for the stresses that it's doing. Like, and there's no other really way to train for your body trying to land off of, let's just go uneven bars, for example. You're landing off of that jump coming price. Some people are 12, 10, 12 feet off the air. So now you're landing at two and a half times your body weight. Like, And then not only are you landing it, you have to stick it. And it's like, how well can you control your center of mass and like moving through air freely while doing like a double full body fully extended from your head to your toes, like, and then stick that landing and be perfect at it. So it's like, it's really cool to see like that detail, but understanding like how just strong that you are. Like I can only imagine like when you probably first got done, like going your first rock climbing lift, like your forearms are probably shot. And it's like, we had an assistant coach in Greenville this past year, Taylor Jackson. Um, she loves rock climbing. So like Greenville, she would go out and like climb around. Like there was a couple of gyms in the area that she would go at and like was a regular there and like would actually even like search out like places when we're on the road to kind of go rock climbing at. And it was like one of her passions and like, it's the same thing. Like she has a background in strength and conditioning, but, and understand like the importance of everything that she does in the weight room and how it can help her like chase and, and do the daily activities that she like doing. Like she ended up buying a mountain bike this year and like going through Asheville with another one of our assistant coaches. And it's just like, different avenues and different ways to kind of break away from just the daily monotonous of baseball um, to like just be who you are and chase the things that you want to chase down. So, but yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, I saw her training in spring training. I didn't know she was into rock climbing, so I'm going to have to connect with her uh, at some point coming up here, but yeah, it, it's like, even my my own self, I'm like, do I change my training to like get better at rock climbing? Because it's really only like a hobby that I just like doing. Yeah. Um, and I had seen Kiyoshi. We had started training and I hadn't seen him for a while. And then I saw him and he's like, dude, your forearms look huge. And I'm like, yeah, I've been climbing. Like it's got I, it took me some time to get over the hump of like my hands really hurting, my forearms really hurting. And then now I'm at the point where like, 
I'm starting to do some of the intermediate stuff and I'm like, do I change my training to like get better at climbing? Do I just keep lifting and climbing like, you know, concurrently? Like, I don't know. Cause the thing is like, you go in there and like a lot of them are, a lot of the climbers are like lean, very, very thin. Cause like, obviously you're carrying extra weight. Like, and I'm in there at like 215, 220 and I'm like, you know, very muscle bound. So like I can get away with just being strong and climbing the walls, but um, I don't know, like, do I start changing my training? I'm gonna have to talk to her. That That's gonna be another <laughs> talk, I'm uh, offline. Um, so <laughs> let's let's go to baseball now. So like, what is your best professional baseball story thus far? I know you haven't been in a super long time, but um, usually even within one year, like people have great stories. So what is your, your top story, whether triumph or laugh or like just something that sticks out in your mind so far? Yeah. Yeah, I think the two that come to mind, um, so obviously Sedan Rafael makes his major league debut this year at the Red Sox and had him pretty briefly last year um, for the first part of the year before he got promoted to double A. And so there's a new renovation for our weight room in Greenville and there's a nice TV inside. And we had the day he was making his debut up uh, on the TV. So like we had probably three quarters of the guys like on the team, like in the weight room, like watching at the bat pitch by pitch, like having that and like kind of just taking a step back and like reflecting of listen, this is the goal for all these guys in this room right now. And like seeing them like so passionate about one of more or less like their brothers who like have come through the org together, like is making his major league debut and making an impact on the level that they all want to make an impact on was a really cool experience. Um, my second one, it's got to be winning the uh, South Atlantic League this year, guys. I mean, I think, the guys who were with us from day one to the end um, was is definitely a grind. I mean, we snuck in the back door to winning and clinching the first half. Like somehow Winston Salem lost three in a row, we lost three in a row, and then but we had the half game lead and clinched the front half. So snuck in that way. Um, and then the back half of the year was kind of up and down. So, I mean, there was like we know we're going to the playoffs, but like came in the came into playoffs getting swept in Aberdeen, Maryland, and then it's like all right, boys, like settle up like we got to go to hickory play game one of the playoffs and then but they just found another gear i mean went to hickory went against some of their best arms that the rangers have in their system and won there won at home and then made our way up to hudson valley won there and had some guys just make some great plays and in, in key moments and then we ended up popping bottles back at basket our place in greenville but it was just really cool experience um of really fortunate to be in like that situation obviously like not everybody who like who goes through professional baseball or goes through elite levels of sport in general like have the opportunity to win a championship um and i gotta give credit to iggy suarez our manager on that he's like been around the game for a long time and he's like that was the first time of his ability to be able to go pop bottles with and celebrate with everybody so it's like those moments like you really sit back and and appreciate like all the hard work that they do and everything that we do as the strength coaches and support staff is like for those guys to go to make moments like that. So obviously we would like them to be popping balls in Boston sometime soon, but at the same time, like getting their taste of success at the lower level and, and wanting to keep pushing that. I think that's going to be a, an ultimate piece to helping these guys develop because we know develop winning is as much part as much a part of development than anything we do in the weight room. So. Yeah, the I'll hit on both of those there. So the first one with the debut, it's like I, I can remember very specifically in double A, we had a guy get called up to the big leagues for his debut. And like after our game, we're all watching him in the clubhouse. And like at one point, one year we had like Moncada, Benintendi, Devers, like they were all there. They all kind of went up and it was like it's just cool to play a small part in in guys ultimately achieving their dream. And like you said, everybody stops and watches. And like, even in spring training, you know, some of those minor league kids during their lifts at the end of the day are watching the big league game on the TV. And you got like that back half of the game guy, the reliever that comes in, who's like, you know, he's he's like a backup for the day. He's never pitched above a ball. And he's like in a big league spring training game. And even those yeah. moments, like those guys are watching and I'm like, part of me is like, Hey, like, let's get to work. Like that can be you someday. And part of me is like, you know, they're cheering on their friends or supporting their friends. So like, it's cool to see when those guys go up 
And I think, like you said, taking that step back and one, appreciating the the small part that we play, but two, like understanding that everybody in the room has that dream as well, um, ourselves included, right? Like, yep. you know, when you're grinding through the minor leagues as a strength coach, an athletic trainer, a hitting coach, it doesn't matter. Like most people, their goal is to get to the big leagues. And um, it's definitely worth it when you get there and it's cool to see other people do it and to be able to appreciate it in that short moment. Like it really is valuable. And then the other side of that, that you're talking about, is like when I was in double a, I think my first year, maybe my second year too, they didn't do the two halves. We only did one season mm -hmm. and it always sucked because it was like, we had a good team either in the first half or the second half. And then like, guys move up or like you know if you're bad in the first half like your prospects move up and you're good in the second half but like you weren't good enough mm -hmm. to get to the playoffs and then I want to say maybe 19 my first year in triple a was when they switched to the halves and double a and I was like well we would have made the playoffs at least once like we had good enough teams so like I never got to experience that right I never got to experience the playoffs and and I think, like you said, one of the really valuable and underappreciated things in the minor leagues is learning to win and like learning to work together and play the game the right way. And like those guys that come up to Boston or come up to really anywhere in the big leagues, like they may be a big fish in a small pond in the minor leagues, but they're just another guy when they get to the big leagues. And it happened with one of our guys where he was you know, like he was really tearing the world apart in double A and he was a utility guy. He played the field well. And, you know, our manager told him like, you're going to have to bunt when you go to the big leagues. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like I'm raking here. And he's like, when you go up there, like you're going to be a bench guy. Like you need to know how to play the game. You need to know how to win the game. And mm -hmm. if it requires you bunting, moving a guy over, working a count, playing good defense, like that's what you're going to be called up for. So like, Part of the development window, I think, like you said, is just learning to win and learning how to play games the right way. And it's something that I never personally experienced in the minor leagues. Um, you know, in 21, we made the playoffs and we popped our bottles and, you know, we did our thing for a little bit there. But um, it's just such an underappreciated part of development, I think, is is learning to play the game of baseball and learning to win the game of baseball, because ultimately that's what it is. It's who scores more runs than the other team. And you either have to prevent those runs or you have to score those runs and how you manufacture those or prevent those does matter. Um, and I think some of those guys, especially nowadays, get so enamored with like, I have to hit homers. I have to do this. I have to do that. And then they get to the big leagues and they're like the low man on the totem pole and they're hitting eighth or ninth in the lineup. And we're like, you know, we just need you to work a count. Like we need mm -hmm. you to put together good at bats man's on second no outs we need you to move him over like we need you to flip the line up to the top to the big boys like your time will come to be you know a, a jefe in the big leagues but right now we yeah. need you to help the team win so it's an interesting dynamic of like you got to post your numbers in the minor leagues to move up but you also have to know how to play the game and win the game um yeah. that i think sometimes that aspect gets overlooked not i'm not saying anywhere specifically just as a general like you know observation of of where the game is at right now um it's just like that aspect is sometimes overlooked for metrics and you know exit velos and bat speeds and things like that so probably just my own two cents there but <laughs> no, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head i think a lot of it too it's unfortunately like we're starting to see like the showcase era like player kind of starting to make their way through and obviously that's a whole another rabbit hole another conversation um but at the end of the day it's like it's a team sport it has individual pieces to it but um you have to do the best you can with your ability to help the team win um regardless of that's laying down a sack bunt in the eighth inning to get the game winning ground to third base or whatever it may be like you can't cheat the game you got to get 27 outs you got to score more runs than the other team like flat out so that's the part where it's like that layer of development um, is is a big piece for the guys. Let's uh, let's kind of go not necessarily down that same rabbit hole, but what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you are crazy for believing? Is it something along the lines of development like we're talking about, or is there something totally totally different? 
I think I kind of went like more of like a different route with this. Um, I think one of the quotes that I, I like to live by is you bring you wherever you go. Um, so I think it's a developmental piece, but it's also the same time of like, whether it's working with the athletes or just being yourself, like you bring you wherever you go, you have to bring the best version of yourself day in and day out. Um, and so whether that's not on the field, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's just the staff, just getting the daily responsibilities done, like we're all humans. We all have things that go on outside of the realm of the sport itself. Like how do you learn how to manage both? Like, this year, like throughout the course of the season, like my wife and I are planning a wedding. It's like, how do you work and plan that while also like knowing and like you have the developmental piece of you have a job to do, you have to make sure the guys get get their stuff done. Where it's, we know the guys on the field are, they're stressed, like they want to perform at a high level and like work their way up. But mom or dad or brother or sister, something back home in a foreign country, thousand miles away is going on and you physically can't be there to help out. So I think, helping those guys manage the waters of life outside the lines to help prepare them to bring their best version of themselves to the field every day is one of the biggest things that is a huge piece. Like at the end of the day, I think later on, like stress is stress, like regardless of it's the stress of trying to create an adaptation in the weight room or the stress of trying to go three for four in a night and, or whatever it may be, like your body's going to respond to how it's going to respond to that stress. So how do you, learn to manage that and be who you are with what you have and what's all going on in this crazy world we live in. Yeah. The, the stress aspect, like my wife and I just got back from Italy. We were there 10 days. We had a great time and she's been sick the last week, like because the stress of just the travel and like, honestly dealing with me for 10 days in Europe, it, you know what I mean? Like I, I have a lot of energy. So I'm like, let's see everything that we can in as little time as we can. You know, we're putting in 20,000 steps a day. We're floating around all over. And she's like, can we have a, a like a chill day? And I'm like, like, I'm a trip guy, not a vacation guy where she's yeah. very much like I'm on vacation. So like we got back and I'm like, damn, I'm ready to go again. Like, can we go yeah. next week? And she's like, I am no, shut up. Like, <laughs> I'm not feeling well. And I'm like, oh, you just need like, a, you need some of these. You'll be fine. And she's like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm sick. So like, yes, to your point, like stress is stress. And then uh, a, a little bit lighter side, like the wedding aspect, like what did your wife think about the fall week? Did you have to like uh, adjust your wedding around the fall week? Because I have a good story about mine. I'm curious how yours went. So, yeah, it was, uh, so my wife's an AT for Kentucky's football team. So we were trying to figure out when the best time for the wedding would be. And it came to the point where like, why don't we just do the bye week this year? So bye week ended up being, um, the weekend of October 20th. And so we're getting ready to go have the date set out, have the venue. She picked the venue when I was in season and getting all the vendors and everything set up. And then, uh, three quarters of the way through the year, I get a phone call. Um, and they're like, Hey, we, uh, we'd like to like you to go to fall league. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what's the start? Like, what's the details? Like what we got? I was like, you guys know I'm getting married. Right. And they're like, yeah, we know you're getting married. Like, um, uh, we'll get that figured out. So, you know, honestly, thankfully the, the Red Sox still were able to get, um, one of our other strength coaches out there for the week so that I was able to go home and, and get stuff set up. But it was definitely like uh, three weeks out in Arizona, go home, get married for the week, and then and then come back for the last three weeks. So, and it was it was wild. We actually had two other players like on the team, one within the Boston Red Sox organization, and then another guy on the Twins, both same thing, got married in the middle of the fall league. So, all of the lives were definitely like definitely a little irritated, but we were able to get everything uh, everything worked out and everything went on. Well, went off without a hitch. So see, you're oh, you're a better man than I am. When when you got the call, you're like, you guys know I'm getting married. When I got the call, I was like, yep, I'm there. Sign me up. And then I called my wife and I was like, hey, I'm going to the fall league. And she was like, when is it? And I told her, she's like, you know, like our wedding is during that. And I was like, oh, it's fine. Like, let's just push the wedding back. And she's like, all right. I'm going to hang up now and you think about what you said and you call me back when you're ready to talk about this and hung up on me. And I was like, Ooh, like, 
So I, I, you know, I have to call, I have to call the Sox. I'm like, Hey, I'm getting married. Like I'll be out there. So we got married on a Saturday. So after the game Friday, I took a red eye home. I landed at 9 AM. Our wedding was at 2 PM. I stayed the night and then I flew back Sunday and I was there Monday. So I missed the Saturday game. It was a day game. So like we didn't do anything anyway. So I missed the one game and, uh, no honeymoon or anything like just my wife is like is a saint um I think anybody that has met her knows she is the saint and especially like putting up with me and all my nonsense but um yeah that phone call where I was like I'm in let's do it and they're like you don't have any like other things in the way I'm like nope I'll figure it out we're all good thank you call her I'm like I'm going to the fall league we're just gonna have to change the wedding that's all and in my mind I'm like you know that's no big deal we'll just change it to a yeah, different we'll, week we'll just she, figure it out and she's like you know we have the venue we have the we have the pastor we have the food we have this that and we had a small wedding like we had like you know yeah. just family very very small and she's like we have all of this stuff and I'm like can we change it and she's like all right I'm hanging up now so thankfully um she hung with me thankfully it worked out for us I'm glad yours worked out well um obviously yeah. Congrats on the wedding. And I know you guys have, you have many years of happiness together, but um, I, you are a much better man than I am for <laughs> the way you approached it. I was like, yes, I'll figure it out. Not, hey, I'm getting married. Can we figure this out? So um, we'll get to the fall league in a second here. But before we do, um, you were named the South Atlantic League Strength Coach of the Year this year. I've had many Strength Coaches of the Year on here every time that it's up. Um, you know, I have to mention it's peer peer voted. And so others in the league know that you're doing something well and I want to know what it is. So first and foremost, congrats to you on the award. Uh, and second, what are you doing that makes you successful? And then third, what do you think makes a strength coach successful kind of just in general? Yeah, first, thank you. Uh, I actually got to give a shout out to all the other strength coaches in the league. Like uh, Saturday League's an awesome league. Um, and I got to give a shout out to all those guys because obviously like that award doesn't happen without them and in their vote for me. Um, so that doesn't, I don't want to let that slip by without uh, giving a knowledge to those guys. Cause there's some incredible guys in that league. And I like, think I know even I'll give a shout out to, to Logan Jones and, and Brett Platt, like Brett got called up like second, third week of the season from low A to, to high A. Like they needed to kind of fill a spot when one of their strength coaches went down and after he was able to take that team all the way up to the playoffs, they won the back half and like, everybody down there is doing great work so but um so what makes uh me successful i think at the end of the day i'm super detail oriented i mean sometimes i think that could be kind of my downfall um and with just getting caught up in the weeds of the details but uh with that uh, it's it's building out routines um for myself included like obviously our end of the days we're trying to help these guys get to the big leagues and routine building with especially with how professional baseball works like is a huge piece of that um so whether it's building out like our daily sheet um so the guys know what they have going on building out our weekly sheet uh workload management understanding like all the tech and everything that we're doing um I mean, we're fortunate to have an assistant strength coach with us at every affiliate so like helping him and guide him and uh so i'm able to kind of take that step back and and maybe have some more face time with the other strength coaches in their next door like in the building or like be able to go work with our skill coaches and see what they're doing and how we can kind of complement them or like they can pick up um, while our assistant's kind of running the day. Um, so I think it's just a matter of taking care of the things you can control um, and just being just diligent about your work and how you can have an impact on all the guys around you and the guys next door when you're building or and just continually communicating between everybody. Um, so what kind of makes a strength coach successful, like in general, successful in air quotes, I think a lot of it comes down to two things, like communication and feel, um, obviously with the minor leagues, like depending on the organization, like you're going to wear a multitude of hats. So, I mean, speaking for us, it's, we're almost along the lines of like a performance manager at times where we're taking in the input when it comes to the skill coaches on player plans. We're assisting nutrition and making sure the food gets to where it needs to be um, pre and post game, handling the dugout snacks, handling hydration to sports scientists, evaluating and using the tech um, that we have 
in our testing battery that we run through while also being a strength coach, doing the performing, like making sure the guys are doing their running, going in the weight room, doing the things they need to do to get ready every day. Um, but then also like when it comes to feel, I know the podcast before with Joe and with you guys, like, I think the court awareness is like the biggest thing, like you said, but it's like, but it's, it's having the understanding of like who you are, like what's going on with you, what's going on with everybody else. Um, and kind of balancing everything like almost it's like you're trying to juggle a ton of things at one time but at the same time like there's gonna be things that are higher priority than others and how do you manage like what's priority versus what's not and also understand that those guys that we're going to battle with every night are going through things too so it's having that that self-awareness but also a situational awareness of when do you need to put the gas pedal down? When do you need to pump the brakes? And honestly, sometimes like when you need to call some people out on their shit, like put it bluntly, like it's just, it's a good brotherhood that gets built and a good camaraderie with everybody in the group because um, there's nowhere else in the world that compares to a locker room or a weight room and being together with somebody 130 plus, 162 plus times a, a year. Like, so having that, that feel and that awareness, I think, is another big piece of it that at the end of the day is going to help you be successful. I think another thing, too, is having respect and love for your clubbies, um, especially at the minor league level. Like, they do a ton for us. Um, that kind of goes on behind the back burner that people don't really realize. Um, you got to give a shout out to Brady winning the, the Club of the Year award for the South Atlantic League. But at the end of the day, like, for them to come in and open up the weight room for other strength coaches, um, who are trying to and getting their programs done for the guys that they have too. It's like they're losing more hours in the day because they have to come in and open up a weight room for somebody else that isn't even a part of our organization. So having an appreciation for them um, and just handling the business the way that they do, I think that's a, a huge piece of the puzzle. I didn't know they had the clubhouse manager of the year, but that's such a good award because they do so much at every level, big leagues, all the way down through the system. Um, they need their own podcast of great stories and, and things that they do. That would probably be a fun one. And then, I mean, these are all really valid points. Um, and just kind of being around you, like I would say, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head with yourself. Um, the one thing that you did mention is like being detail oriented also might be like your downfall as well. I, I'm, I'm a believer that our biggest strength is our biggest weakness. And a lot of the times, like, we lean so heavily into our own strength that it it becomes you know it becomes a downfall for us it becomes a weakness and trying to keep that in check and i think having that awareness of it is a is a good way to prevent it i know for me like i've always wanted to be you know the hardest worker in the room and be just relentless with my work ethic mm -hmm. and like when i see other people getting tired it like pushes me to go further to work even harder and it gets to the point where like you literally just burn yourself out. And like, I've, I've hit that point. Like I, I know how that feels. And it's like, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a hard reality to kind of like check in on yourself and be like, well, this is what makes me successful. But also like, if I don't keep this in check, like this is going to really ruin me. So it's good that you have that awareness for yourself. Um, I think all the points that you really hit on, regardless of professional baseball or not, like are just are relevant to strength coaches in general. And um, I think, you know, for me, the skills that you learn in professional baseball tr can transfer over. And, you know, I've been talking to people about this lately is like, if I was to go into professional soccer per se, or, or hockey, like, I don't know what the day to day looks like, and it would take me time to adjust to that. But the skills that I have uh, accumulated in my years in professional baseball, like, will help me no matter where I go, even if it's not in strength and conditioning, even if I, I don't know, sell cars or something you know what I mean like the skills that I have learned here will transfer over and then the easy part is just figuring out the day-to-day -day. like that's not that's not the challenging part the challenging part is like you say you know building the routines like taking care of the things you can control being really good at communicating having some awareness of your yourself and your surroundings like all of those skills if you're good at those like they'll transfer over to whatever job you end up doing and then the day-to-day -day stuff is kind of just you know the icing on the cake that's why i try to say like uh, i've said it nine million times at this point like i really wish everybody could work in professional baseball just 
to learn some of the skills and kind of see the in and out and be on the day to day grind. And like you say, you spend 162 plus days with the same group of people. And it's like, how do you not fight each other? And like, sometimes you do fight each other. You know what I mean? Like sometimes yeah. you have to just like let it out. And then the next day, like you're back and, and there's nowhere, there's nowhere like that. I don't think, um, like you said, a locker room setting, a weight room setting up, just like the amount of time you spend with these people, these athletes, these coaches, like they become a second family to you. A lot of them, like I, I call Kiyoshi, my baseball dad and, Uchi and Masai are my baseball uncles. Like they're as much family to me as, you know, my actual parents are. And it's like a lot of times when I do something stupid and they keep me in check, like they're raising me in, in, in a weird way of like the baseball setting that you just don't, you don't find that in a lot of job environments. And it's, it's cool. It's scary. It's overwhelming. It's fun. It's, you know, annoying and it's everything in between and you're allowed to feel all of those things. And you will, if you work in professional baseball, you, you <laughs> definitely feel all of those things at some point in time. Um, yeah. But that's what makes our game so unique, right? It's just that yeah. all of those things are kind of combined into one. So uh, I think yeah. you hit the nail on the head with all of those points, man. I really do. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, everybody. That's going to conclude part one of this two-part episode with Donnie. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, one, it was cool to talk about training the gymnasts and just something outside of baseball. But more importantly, I think the stories that he shared and the lessons that he shared and, you know, really the ways that he's finding success are, are probably more important and more relevant to all of us in the baseball world. Um, obviously, he won strength coach of the year. I think very highly of him as a young and upcoming strength coach. And, you know, you can learn from everybody. And I think that the, the points he made are really relevant, um, regardless of how long he's been in baseball. So three things that I took from Donnie in this episode, try to bring the best version of yourself every day. Be respectful of all the people who make the day run smoothly and not just strength and conditioning. And communication and feel will help you navigate a lot of situations effectively. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk to you again on the next one.